Hello, everyone. I am Daisuke Imoto, Vice President, External Affairs and Corporate Development of the Jihit Fund. It is our pleasure to host this symposium at the annual meeting for Japanese Society of Topical Medicine today. Before we start, I would like to thank Professor Hitoshi Oshitani, President of the um, Society of Tropical Medicine, and the Secretariat for giving us an opportunity to co-host this symposium. On behalf of the Jihit Fund, we also would like to extend our sincere thanks to the strong leadership of Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine in research and development, education and training programs for young scientists, and facilitation of international partnerships to leverage Japanese science for global health. The symposium we host today aims to give you an overview of the global health R&D funding before and during the pandemic and of funders' investment strategies for neglected diseases as well as emerging diseases. We are now faced with an important challenge, how we can keep the momentum going um, for the elimination of major infectious diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, and neglected tropical diseases while fighting with the emerging infectious diseases and preparing for the future threats. This is the main theme we will be discussing today. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator today, Ms. Anna Dubel, Chief Operating Officer of the Policy Cures Research based in Sydney, Australia. Anna joined the Policy Cures Research in 2015, bringing more than 12 years of experience in the international finance sector. As COO, Anna retains a hands-on role in critical phases of project work, while also driving system develop redevelopment, people management, strategic direction, and future projects. Anna has kindly accepted to serve as a moderator today. She will be one of the speakers as well. As a speaker, she will give a talk about overview of the global health R&D funding landscape by sharing the recent data and analysis. Anna, thank you for being a moderator today. Let's start the program. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Jason San, for your kind introduction. It's my great honor to be invited by GHIT and to speak with the guests of the symposium today. As Daisuke san mentioned, my name is Anna Dubel. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Policy Cures Research and the moderator for this session. Policy Cures Research is a global health research and policy institute. We conduct the annual GFinder survey, which tracks annual investment into R&D for new products and technologies to address priority global health challenges. This includes funding for basic research, and as well as the development of new drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and other tools that are used um, for global health priorities that disproportionately affect people in low and middle income countries, such as neglected diseases, emerging infectious diseases, and sexual and reproductive health issues. In this discussion on the future of the global health R&D funding landscape, I like to think of our GFinder work as similar to a cartographer's. We are surveying, describing, and documenting the landscape, providing a map so that others can find their way more easily, making better decisions about which path to take. In this landscape of funding for global health R&D, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a seismic shift. Seismic shifts, earthquakes, cause terrible damage, and the death of at least 5 million people and the suffering of many more weighs heavily on us. But some of the most staggering landscapes are born of seismic shifts. And today we're going to investigate the damage, but also look to some of the opportunities and progress that might have come from the pandemic. I'm going to use the GFinder data to provide a zoomed out map of R&D funding. I'll then introduce each of the panel members who will speak about their organisations and how they are responding to COVID. Following the discussion and the presentations, I have a few questions for the panel and I encourage you to also submit your questions in the chat function. Let's begin by looking back at what we knew earlier this year. 
For the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to focus on neglected diseases. And in GFinder, that includes HIV, TB, malaria, some of the NTDs, as well as other diseases where there is a product gap. So no, and there's no financial incentive to invest. And the, the, dis, uh, the burden is disproportionately on populations in low and middle income countries. And what you can see from this chart is that each year around three and a half or four billion dollars, US dollars, is invested in R&D for these diseases. About 1.3 billion goes to HIV. TB and malaria each get around 650 million. 350 million goes to the group of neglected tropical diseases. And then the remainder goes to diseases like bacterial pneumonia and meningitis, hep B, hep C, salmonella infections, and importantly, as we'll see, platform technologies. Let's look at the trend over the past 13 years. And what we see here is a pretty positive picture. Um, of course, there are product gaps that remain and more funding and more research is still needed. But what we saw in sort of 2018-19 was that funding was at over $4 billion a year. And we had seen this sustained growth since about 2015. We had also seen funding weather some storms. Um, and that's going to give us some hints as to what might happen in the future. In 2014 and 15, there was a global response to the Ebola outbreak. And over half a billion dollars was invested in 2015. Now that's not displayed in this picture because um, we classify Ebola as an emerging infectious disease, disease rather than neglected disease. But you can see here that in 14, 15, you didn't see cannibalization um, of, of these neglected disease funding. And then if we go a little bit further back um, to around 2007, 2008, we had the global financial crisis. Um, so an, a, an, a shock, but an economic shock. And so there was concern there that there would be um, cuts to neglected disease funding. But in fact, what we saw was that the stimulus funding, particularly from governments, resulted in record level funding. And, and those levels wouldn't be beaten until just recently. Let's look at who provided the funding. So the US government is, government is by far the largest player in this space, um, and it provides almost 50% of investment over the past decade. So when we are navigating this landscape, it's important to keep an eye on what American um, public funding is doing, and that's particularly from the NIH. And you can see this growth over the past few years from the US, um, from the US government. But the increase in neglected disease funding hasn't just been due to investment from the US. There have been contributions from government agencies in India, which has shown really strong growth, Germany, um, the U EU, the UK, as well as Japan. Looking more closely at uh, funding from the UK, and this is funding that comes from agencies like the FCDO, which has previously differed, the MRC and DHSC. And this is one to watch um, and one that we've been particularly interested in through the pandemic, um, because we did see a step change in how the UK government was funding to neglected diseases. Um, around 2017, they really had a, a step change. But we also know that there have been drastic cuts to aid. Um, and so we weren't sure, sure how that was going to affect R&D funding. So the European Commission is the third largest public funder and their funding has been relatively steady. But within the European Commission funding, there are in fact three different sort of programs and partnerships. And uh, one of our panel members, Lara, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, represents the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership. Um, and funding to the EDCTP actually increased over the past few years. Industry also plays an important role in neglected disease R&D funding. And in 2018, we saw industry contribute over $700 million. Now this fell in 2019, 
um, but it still remained above historical averages. And we thought that some of that reduction was actually due to the end of some clinical trials. So that reduction really made sense. And we've also known that neglected disease R&D funding was growing at the same time as investment for emerging infectious disease R&D. And that includes the Ebola response that I mentioned, as well as investment in CEPI. So it really does appear that there wasn't that cannibalization of neglected disease funding. So if we turn around and sort of look back at our landscape, that's what we would see. A relatively healthy neglected disease funding landscape, albeit dependent on a small number of major funders. Then COVID arrived. Now, GFinder looks retrospectively at actual disbursements that have been made. At Policy Cures Research, we didn't want to wait a full 12 or 18 months to get an idea of how the world was responding to this challenge. So we started tracking publicly announced commitments. I'm gonna show you some numbers, but please bear in mind that commitments and disbursements can't be directly compared. Commitments may not always come to fruition um, and commitments may cover a number of years. Whereas disbursements are certain, it's money out the door and we track annual spending. So we know the time period. On the other side, our COVID tracking was limited to only public, publicly announced data. So we know that we didn't get complete coverage, particularly from the pharmaceutical industry. All that said, by May 2020, over $4 billion had been announced for COVID-19 R&D funding. It took just five months to reach the total that all of the neglected diseases usually get in a year. And by the end of September, we were up to 9 billion. So that's more than twice the total. So although we can't compare directly, it does give you sort of an idea of the scale of this seismic event. And this raised a number of questions. It was great to see the rapid response and the generosity of governments. And even more, it was staggering to see the scientific progress and vaccines being developed in record time. But what we were worried about was the implications for funding for neglected diseases and for actually conducting the research. So back in, in early this year, 2021, we were preparing the GFinder report that used financial year 19 data. And we entitled it, Where To Now? Because there were a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer at that point. I am hoping that um, today's discussion um, will shed some light on some of these answers and that our panel members will also be able to contribute. So we traditionally release uh, the GFinder results in December or January. It takes that long to clean, analyze and write the report. Um, but the PCR team has been hard at work. So I'm pleased to be able to give you a sneak peek at some of the data. Total funding for neglected disease R&D looks to have fallen by about 4% to just less than $4 billion. In the scheme of things, this reduction of around $170 million probably isn't as bad as we had feared. We're still substantially above the levels that we saw over the last decade. But we do advise some caution when looking at these numbers because it's possible that um, funding for R&D was committed before the pandemic and that the reductions, um, any reductions that we might see might in fact come in the future. On the other hand, um, it's also possible that funding fell because it was more difficult to conduct research in 2020. And um, that's a topic that our guests guests might discuss today. We're also hopeful that um, like in response to the global financial crisis, that some of the economic stimulus programs, as well as, you know, frankly, a much greater awareness of the importance of global health R&D will in fact increase funding in the future. So this reduction has basically been seen across the board with falls from the public sector, including from the US and the UK, but this reduction probably wasn't um, as bad as we feared. Again, um, 
So we're not seeing that slashing of aid cuts um, terrifically uh, affect R&D funding from the UK quite yet, if indeed we will at all. Um, the EU bucked the trend with an increase, and that's particularly to EDCTP. And another area that we were particularly worried about was funding from aid agencies and ODA. Um, we were concerned that ODA might be repurposed for COVID. Um, and we have seen a reduction of about 13%, um, but it is still higher than it was in 14-15. Industry funding fell by 12%, and that's following, um, as I mentioned before, a reduction between 2018 and 2019. So that's going to be one to watch because we haven't seen funding from industry at such low levels since 2015. And as expected, uh, funding for EIDs skyrocketed. With funding for COVID, uh, we think it was above for $4.5 billion in 2020. So remember that we, we saw a figure of $9 billion. That was commitments. What we're seeing in actual disbursements is going to be probably lower than that. But as I explained, that there are some um, qualifications about the data that we have, and we're still investigating those. So as we look around and survey where we are now, we can see some damage to the neglected disease R&D funding space. And we still have some concerns about sort of the structural integrity, if you will, but it could have been a lot worse. We've also seen some exciting investments and developments in platform technology um, and increased awareness and respect for infectious diseases and an appreciation of tools like vaccines um, that we might hope carry over from COVID to some of the other infectious diseases. At Policy Cures Research, we're going to continue to analyze the data and to try to make sense um, and provide answers to some of the questions that I've outlined here. But in the meantime, we are joined here today by speakers from four organizations. I'm looking forward to the detail and color that they'll be able to provide as we review our landscape of R&D funding. First up, we'll hear from Mahoko Kashiwakura from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation contributes around 20% of the global investment in neglected disease R&D each year. Um, and it also has really important initiatives in advocacy and resource mobilization for neglected diseases. And I look forward to hearing from Mahoko about the Foundation's work, particularly in Japan and the region. After Mahoko, I'll pass the baton to Masahiko Noda from Japan's Agency for Medical Research and Development, AMED. Noda-san is the Managing Director of the Department of International Strategy and will be providing an overview of AMED's work in neglected diseases, as well as, as its new initiatives in emerging infectious diseases. A representative from our host, the GHIT Fund, Daitsuki Emoto, will speak after Noda-san. GHIT brings together funding from the Gates Foundation, the Japanese government, industry, as well as other organisations. And it coordinates and directs research in neglected diseases and plays a really important role in neglected disease R&D, particularly in this region. And then finally, we have Lara Pandia from the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership, EDCTP. I like to think of GHIT and EDCTP as sort of cousins, as they share some of the same funders and operate under a similar model, coordinating funding and research. Mahoko san over to you. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for the GHIT group for um, having me today. Um, my name is Mihoko and I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation based in Tokyo. Um, but I would like to first start with um, a video remark from Jihad's um, EXO official member of the board as well as NTD's director, Katie Owen. Greetings, friends and colleagues. It is an honor to join you this evening at the 62nd Annual Meeting of the Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine. I'm Katie Owen, Director of Neglected Tropical Diseases at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is an important meeting. From the public to private sectors, from delivery programs that have eliminated diseases to some of the biggest breakthroughs in R&D, 
Japan has been a major contributor to the last decade's progress against neglected diseases. Thank you to the organizers and the many partners who, whose efforts make that progress possible. To the government of Japan, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, and members of the Diet who have been champions for neglected diseases R&D. To the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund and its partners, as well as Welcome Trust. To our private sector partners, especially ASI, which has been a world leader in the elimination of a lymphatic filariasis. And to the Japanese academic and research community, and all who have pushed forward neglected diseases R&D. The Gates Foundation's core belief is that everyone should have the ability to lead a healthy and productive life. There are few initiatives that exemplify this purpose more than our work on neglected tropical diseases, which impact the poorest communities in the world and through illness and disability, keep them in endless cycles of poverty. There has been enormous progress against NTDs in the past two decades, thanks in large part to Japan's contributions. These past two years have been difficult, and I'm encouraged, encouraged to see countries innovating to keep NTD drug distribution going, even during COVID. But resuming programs with our existing pools will only take us so far. Investing in R&D for NTDs now is necessary to end these diseases. I'm inspired by the unwavering dedication of the Japanese R&D community to help develop tools to eliminate neglected diseases and improve the lives of many worldwide. The foundation focuses its NTD funding where our support can have a catalytic impact. That is why we work with partners like GHIT to develop and deliver new treatments and diagnostics through rigorous R&D and innovative partnerships. I am greatly encouraged by some of GHIT's investments, especially to bring forth a treatment for pediatric schistosomiasis through the Pediatric Praziquantel Consortium. If approved, the treatment would be much easier to administer to preschool age children, protecting them at an early age critical for their long-term development. This will take a global effort. Speaking to you, I'm reminded of Nobel laureate, Dr. Satoshi Amura, whose collaboration with William Campbell of Merck led to the discovery of ivermectin, the drug that has protected hundreds of millions of people from river blindness. If we keep up the spirit of collaboration from pediatric schistosomiasis and ivermectin, staying committed and working together across the public and private sectors, we will reach the end of NTDs and other neglected diseases. I'm very excited to see where the conversations you have today will lead. I wish you all a good and productive meeting. Thank you. Um, I would like to now share about the Gates Foundation R&D strategy. Um, first, by starting out, a quick introduction about ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as an overview, I'll quickly introduce about the foundation and then introduce um, two examples, the NTD strategy and their approach, pneumococcus strategy and its investment example. And then I'll just quickly introduce our host, GHIT, which is a very important partner for the Gates Foundation. And then also share a brief update on our approach on COVID R&D. So the Gates Foundation at a glance, we are, um, we were founded in 2000. We have over 15, around 1500 employees all over the world. Our annual budget is about 4 billion and the endowment size of 40 billion. And our presence in Tokyo was established in 2017. Next slide, please. Um, today we have, um, I would like to introduce the pneumonia team and NTD's team's R&D strategy, um, but as a structure, our organization have five, no, six organizations, six departments, global health, global development, global growth and opportunity, global policy and advocacy, gender equality, U.S. program. We would just like to share that two thirds of our budget goes to global health and global de development programs. Next slide, please. I would like to start by sharing out um, the NTD's team strategy um, and how we set and then pursue our R&D priorities in that team. So our NTD team focused on eight of, out of the more than 20 disease recognized by WHO as NTDs. 
We pick those diseases because we think there is potential to eliminate, eradicate, or otherwise drastically transform the course of the disease. Um, each of the diseases we invest is in a slightly different point and requires different investments along its path, especially when they come to platforms. Um, they are often interrelated with each other and for other diseases the foundation cares about as well. So we invest in new drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and vector control tools, along with improvements to programmatic approaches. We have a little under 90 million per year for the NTD scheme. And unfortunately, it's not enough to support all of the projects that we, we'd like to. And so whenever we make decisions, we ask, um, these are very tough decisions to make when we, um, in terms of investment choices. We always ask three basic questions. Is A, is funding limited in this space? B, is this investment likely to have a catalytic effect that pushes our disease goals forward? And C, are we in a better space to assume the risk or are there others who don't share our resources and our flexibility, ability to make long-term investments? Um, I would like to go to the next slide. We would like to introduce a brief example of how we approach guinea worm disease. Um, as he, many of you will know, guinea worm has been around for at least thousands of years, and it's an extremely painful, debilitating disease with no real treatment other than to extract the worm as safely as possible. Um, the key in beating guinea worm disease is to break its water-based life cycle, which you will see here, and it very much relies on the affected person soaking the affected body part in a body of water to relieve that pain. Um, after decades of incredibly hard work, the world has had fewer to 20 reported cases of guinea worm disease per year, down from nearly a million per year 30 years ago. So this has been a major progress. And we thought we were very close to eradicating it until we learned a few years ago that dogs can also be infected too. And since then we've learned that infections can also happen with cats and baboons. And so it turns out that our best intervention is teaching people how to safely deal with infection without continuing that life cycle and offering rewards for identified cases which wouldn't really work well for cats and dogs. So we needed now new tools to try to interrupt the life cycle and avoid backsliding when we're so close to eradication. So you can see what we're investing in here, near larvicides, satellites imageries, and drones to identify water sources that can be treated, diagnostic based on mRNA technology and new genomic analysis to try to figure out how and where the worms are spreading in order to track down the sources. Um, although guinea worm isn't like many other diseases in that we're not looking for a breakthrough drug or vaccine, the principle is very much the same. So we find the critical necessary intervention and try to de develop and bring it into the field as fast as possible. So this is one approach to our R&D. I'd like to move on to the next slide to quickly introduce our pneumococcus strategy overview here. Our initiative and goal is to very much reduce, reduce the burden of pneumococcal infections by expanding coverage of existing vaccines, developing lower cost vaccines, um, and also generate evidence for sustainable pneumococcal immunization programs. And we take four approaches listed here. So our first goal is to reduce the cost of these vaccines to Mugabe to less than $2 per dose. Our second approach is to invest in vaccines that will protect against a broader range of stereotypes. The third is to assess the impact of these PCV vaccines. And the fourth is to pursue alternate dosing and explore fractional dosing to maintain and further reduce the cost. Um, if you can move to the next slide, one of our very important partner is Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, which was established in 2000. And as you can see here on the right, pneumococcal vaccines are 45% of their budget. Um, so you can see how it's a very costly, expensive vaccine. Um, next slide, please. 
And globally, PCV schedules, um, the number of times um, children receive this vaccine is quite different. Um, you can see that in Japan, it's three times. In countries like the UK, um, it's twice. So there's different schedules across the world and there's no global um, one answer to this. So we're approaching and trying to understand through our R&D, um, what is the most co cost effective, but also effect effective and high um, efficiency uh, vaccine schedule. Next slide, please. I would just like to share one example of a Japanese um, R&D that's on the very right bottom. Um, this is a Nagasaki University um, Clinical Research for Pneumococcal Vaccines, which is led by Associate Professor uh, Layman Yoshida um, from the School of Tropical Medicine. Um, we have invested in his research for about $16.8 million for the period of 2016 to 2023. And as you can see here, he is conducting research on different schedules of PCV. So this research was also um, started back in 2006 with our um, great partner, AMED. Um, I believe Mr. Noda will be speaking shortly, but we're very thankful for AMED um, providing this investment through JGRID to um, Professor Kishida's um, research. And so we basically came on later on to uh, add on to the foundation of what AMED has been investing in. So we really hope that AMED and our partners in Japan continue to um, invest in very much impactful research like this one. Next slide, please. And obviously one of our important investments in Japan is really GHIT. I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I believe Mr. Yamoto will be sharing further, but we're very proud about this R&D model. It's the first ever model in the world to have um, a variety of different stakeholders. As you can see in this slide, um, the government, the pharmaceutical industry, um, foundations like ourselves, um, all coming together to, for a core mission to really invest in neglected disease R&D. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to just quickly share our context of COVID R&D at the moment. Um, historical investments in basic research, basic science research on coronavirus and the vaccine platforms such as mRNA, DNA, RNA, had really enabled um, such a rapid coordination on clinical, clinical trials to scale and speed up this innovation. Um, so we believe that this has been very unprecedented scale up in vaccine R&D as well as production. Um, so I think what the world needs to remember that this has not been just out of luck, but it was based on years of preparation and um, investments that was going on. But however, when we look at the world today, low middle income countries continue to face difficulties in accessing these vaccines. Um, and in the global market and demand for diagnostic has continued to be low in little low middle income countries. Um, and also therapeutics have been slow to come to market. Um, next slide, please. I'm just gonna quickly skim through what our current approach in this context is. So, First of all, what are we focusing on? And the second piece will be who will we be focusing on? On forward-looking focus on the what, we're advocating for a coordinated global R&D roadmap um, to stay ahead of any COVID evolution and emerging threats. We're also advocating for scaled up government and international funding for R&D. Um, the third is investing in vaccine development and manufacturing capacity, which has been a very important priority for us. And fourth is really developing next generation diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, and when it comes to the WHO, um, we we're hoping to catalyze a locally led R&D ecosystem. Um, so this is our current approach um, in COVID R&D. Thank you. Thank you, Mahoko-san. Um, it's wonderful to see the, uh, the work that the foundation has been doing, particularly 
um, in the region. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of the researchers in this virtual room um, will be grateful for the foundation's support, including us at Policy Cures Research. But just as important um, is the foundation's work in promoting the advocacy and promoting the collaboration um, that is necessary in this area. Also great to see how closely you work uh, with the Japanese government. So the Japanese government contributes to global health R&D through investments in a number of agencies, um, including the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, the Ministry for, of Foreign Affairs, and of course, the Agency for Medical Research and Development. Noda-san, representing AMED, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for introducing me, Anna-san. <clears throat> I am Masahiko Noda from the uh, Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development. Uh, thank you for inviting me to today's panel discussion. I would like to briefly introduce AMED's activities for research and development on infectious diseases, including NTDs. Let, let me share my slides. AMED was uh, established in 2015. And this year marks the second year of AMED's second five years plan. As an initial budget for AMED for uh, fiscal year 2021 is approximately uh, 126.1 billion yen, which is uh, approximately 1.15 billion US dollars. In addition, an additional budget of 17.5 uh, billion yen or uh, 0.16 billion US dollars is provided each year to accelerate uh, research, etc. So the total annual budget will be approximately 143.6 billion yen or 1.31 billion US dollars. The size of AMS budget varies from year to year but so far it has remained roughly this size. In its second five-year plan, uh, AMED has six integrated projects focusing on modalities such as drug discovery, medical devices, regenerative medicine and cell therapy, and so on. R&D from basic to clinical is driven by these projects under the coordination of program directors working together with MEXT, METI, and the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. Um, diseases. Uh, research and development in seven prioritized diseases areas. Um, including infectious disease, uh, cancer, chronic diseases, and so on. It's planned and managed across all six modalities, making it possible to promote flexible research and development. This slide shows a uh, percentage of AMED research expenditure spent on each of the nine major diseases areas uh, specified in the international classif classification of diseases. Infectious diseases expenditure is second only to cancer. Over five years to 2019, on average, 9.5% of project, project funded and 8.2% of funding by AMED was in the field of infectious diseases. So this busy slide summarizes 
the number of projects and the amount of funding awarded by disease areas. Also categorized using the international classification of diseases. In the field of infectious diseases, more than a thousand and a hundred projects have received a total of 54.5 billion N or 495 million US dollars. The data for this past five year period is summarized in the AMED data book in Japanese and English, available on the AMED web website. As of January 2021, AMED has been promoting emergency research in 300 projects for the development of COVID-19 therapeutics, vaccine, and diagnostics, as well as epidemiology, improvement of the research environment, and international joint research in the COVID-19 project. Uh, although I will not go into detail here, uh, research relating to the COVID-19 pandemic has been conducted from various viewpoints. The government invested 193 billion yen or 1.75 billion US dollars in COVID-19 related uh, research. Of that amount, AMED has been allocated 178.6 billion yen or 1.26 billion US dollars, uh, which is about the same amount as AMED's annual budget. Fortunately, the government has appropriated these funds in a supplementary budget. So there is no major impact on the second five year research plan. Research on neglected tropical diseases in collaboration with other countries is mostly conducted in collaboration with countries in Africa and Asia. Though we also have collaboration with Turkey and El Salvador, to date, we have implemented five, 15 projects, uh, totaling 3.4 billion N or approximately $31 million. Africa is one of the most important regions in which NTD's research programs are conducted. The WHO NTD's roadmap uh, assesses the degree of progress on countermeasure against various NTDs. This slide breaks down uh, progress in, into achieving scientific understanding, diagnostics, and effective intervention, showing that uh, degree of, of progress on, scale, on a scale from green to red. Red meaning that critical action is still required. It also shows the type of diseases for which AMS projects are being promoted. Some projects over, uh, sorry, some projects cover multiple countries and multiple uh, diseases. Uh, so there is overlap in numbers. In Africa, AMS projects are focused mainly on diagnostics, targeting NTDs requiring more attention. And in Asia, focusing on specific diseases such as dengue fever and rabies. So we need to implement research outcomes in African and Asian societies while uh, continuing to work to bridge technologies gap to effective countermeasures. To this end, 
we need to expand our activities in cooperation with many stakeholders. Every year, AMED holds a symposium with the participation of stakeholders from Africa and Japan to share research results and deepen activities for social implementation. I'd like to thank Ms. Kashiwakura of the Gates Foundation and Mr. Katsuno of the Head for their participation in this symposium, which was held on Monday this week. We will continue to cooperate with you and their activities to implement Japan's research achievements in Africa and Asia. Finally, I will conclude my presentation by asking for your support and cooperation in these activities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nodasan. We appreciate it. I was uh, struck by your slide uh, showing that AMED has invested in 300 projects for COVID. Um, and I congratulate you and your staff on responding so quickly and so thoroughly. Um, and it was also reassuring to hear that the budget uh, spent on COVID won't affect other infectious disease R&D investment. Our next, speak next speaker, Daisuke Emoto, who we have already met at the beginning of this session, is the Vice President, External Affairs and Corporate Development at our host, GHID. Daisuke-san has a background in research, having previously worked at DNDI, one of the product development partnerships that was established to progress research in neglected diseases. So I look forward to hearing his views on the research agenda of GHID. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your kind introduction. Um, Noda-san, would you please stop sharing your slides? Thank you. Anna, can you, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. OK, so let me start. So as briefly mentioned by, um, kindly mentioned by Mihoko, Jihit Fund is a public-private partnership um, R&D fund based out of Tokyo. Um, and Jihit mobilized Japanese industry, academia, and research institutes to create new drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics for malaria, tuberculosis, and MTDs in collaboration with global partners. Um, as most of you know, um, our funding pool is composed of Japanese government, um, Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust, as well as uh, Japanese different pharmaceutical and diagnostics companies. I will not go into the details of the um, uh, funding compositions, but we have successfully raised around 150 million for the first replenishment cycle of our organization, which was from 2013 to 2017. And we are in the fourth year of the uh, replenishment, replenishment cycle, second replenishment cycle, and we have raised 200 million US dollars for this cycle. And as you can see uh, on this slide, uh, those are the breakdown of our investment by amount of investment. And as you can see in the uh, left on the left uh, pie chart, we have a clear focus on MTDs. And in terms of interventions, um, our investments is mainly for drugs and vaccines, but, but we are trying to expand our investment in diagnostics as well. And in regards to development stage, um, our preclinical and clinical projects um, account for more than, sorry, 80% um, of our investment, but I would like to stress that we have continuously invested in discovery efforts in collaboration with Japanese pharmaceutical partners. So here's the um, GHIT portfolio. So as of November 2021, 
So there are 63 ongoing projects, including 90, 29 discovery, 24 clinical, and 10 clinical trials in the GHIT portfolio. Um, the total amount of investment since 2013 is 26.9 billion yen. Well, then COVID-19 forced us to adapt to new ways of working and convening. So during the fiscal year 2020, last year, um, by organizing governance body meetings remotely, we could ensure our continuity and excellence. So we had to organize board meetings virtually and se selection committee remotely. And uh, we could successfully invest um, US dollar 41.6 million in 22 partnerships, despite the COVID-19 challenges. And when it comes to partners, uh, we could um, invest in five new Japanese and 10 international research and development partners. Um, so the, here are some concrete actions taken during fiscal year 2020 to advance our innovations. Firstly, actually, we have um, expanded our NTD scope from 10 to 20. Now we can invest all the 20 neglected tropical diseases in GHIT product development platforms. And thereby, we have recruited and onboarded 30 new external reviewers. Currently, we have um, in total 150 um, external reviewers that um, evaluate all the proposals coming from uh, coming across the globe. And we have fo actively formed partnerships for new innovations. Uh, we catalyzed partnerships between Japanese and non-Japanese entities through multiple consultations. And one specific example is that we uh, organized an online proposal writing seminar and engaged with various scientific um, conferences. And it's a routine activity, but uh, we continued proactive portfolio management by organizing a semi annual progress report call for all the projects, all the ongoing projects in our portfolio. And lastly, um, we supplementally injected some budget um, for the, especially for the late stage product um, to mitigate the uh, negative impact that has been exact that have been exerted by COVID-19 over the last years. Um, when you look, when we look at the um, external engagement efforts to keep the momentum going um, during the uh, COVID-19 challenges, um, in September this year, we launched these two webinar series inviting various stakeholders in the R&D and access in global health arena. Um, if you look at the left hand side, uh, we are now organizing webinar together with PDP's product development partnerships um, up until March 2021. We have already organized two webinars by now and this month, we will be hosting another webinar together with TB Alliance. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to again thank the Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine for being a sponsor uh, to this webinar. And if you, uh, if you would like to have a better idea of how GHIT has been worked with product development partners and uh, Japanese stakeholders, please register and um, participate in this webinar series. And if you look at the right-hand side and um, in collaboration with Jack NTD, I hope most of you have heard about this organization. This is Japan Alliance for Global Neglected Tropical Diseases, which is hosted at Nagasaki University. Um, this is an alliance which tries to, uh, all the stakeholders that are involved in neglected tropical diseases, research and development, also the access part of the um, MTDs come together within Japan so that the Japanese activities are properly shown um, to the international community 
and they are trying to serve as a bridge between the international NTD community and the Japanese NTD community. Uh, in collaboration with Jago NTD, we are now hosting um, webinars. Another webinar series focusing on access aspect of NTD challenges. And we have also uh, conducted webinars twice by now, and it, it will continue until the end of March uh, next year. So please come join us uh, if you wish to deepen your understanding on the access aspect of NTDs. Then going back to um, our late stage projects, we have now two promising um, late stage projects that are close to um, launch. So one is the Silvamp TB LAN. This is a um, tuberculosis diagnostics kit uh, that has been developed to, uh, in collaboration with FIND and Fujifilm. Now field validation by utilizing 1,700 samples is currently underway. We targeted WHO guideline development group endorsement early next year. Uh, technology transfer and new manufacturing plant creation was already um, realized in Vietnam, and that will facilitate volume manufacturing. And the technology used for this TB LAN was actually repurposed for the antigen test kit for COVID-19 and is now available in the Japanese market. Another example is actually um, briefly mentioned by Katie of Gates Foundation earlier today. This is the um, phase three trial of pediatric formulation of Grazicantil. Now the clinical trial in Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire were completed. And now in the interim analysis, um, we really look forward to the um, outcome of this uh, phase three trial. The access implementation project ADOPT is being conducted to assess and pilot different models of care for treatment implementation. So with that, we are now moving into the um, third replenishment cycle of GKIT-1, which will start in April of 2023. JIT will for sure continue putting a focus on research and development for neglected diseases. We are currently working on the details of the replenishment strategy. But one thing I would like to mention today is that we will attempt to think expansively so that we can start playing a role also in the strengthening of pandemic preparedness together with our partners across the globe. So this is end of my presentation. Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much, Daisuki san I love the uh, title of your presentation, Keeping Our Foot on the Pedal. And it seems that we might take a few detours and we might encounter some bumps on the road, but it's a very admirable approach. Thank you. Now, before we move on to our last panelist, I encourage the audience to put your thinking caps on and consider questions that you might like to put to the guests. Our last panelist is Lara Pandia, a Senior Strategic Partnerships Officer at EDCDP. Now, I mentioned in my introduction that um, the COVID pandemic has raised questions about uh, global collaboration in funding and in research. And I don't think that there's anybody who's better placed to speak about these issues. Lara, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Let me just pull up my slides. Um... All being well, you should be seeing them now. Yeah, Perfect. great. So yes, thank you. And uh, many thanks to GHIT for the invitation to be here. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, so indeed, uh, I'm from the European and Developing Countries uh, Clinical Trials Partnership, um, EDCTP for short. Uh, and I'll just talk you through a little bit what we are for those of you that are less familiar and then go on to talking a bit about our response to COVID and future perspectives. So uh, EDCTP uh, was established in 2003. We are um, a public-public partnership between uh, governments and currently 14 uh, European and 16 African countries. 
uh, supported by the European Union. And uh, we operate as a member state led initiative under Horizon 2020, which is the European Union's uh, framework program for research uh, and innovation. Um, and uh, that receives funding for up to uh, 683 million currently in the current 10 year program that's running uh, from 2014 to 2024 uh, from the European Union, provided that this is matched by contributions from our European um, member countries. So uh, we aim to enhance research capacity and uh, accelerate the development of new or improved medical interventions for the uh, identification, treatment and prevention of poverty related diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and you can see the diseases that uh, we cover in the outer ring of this uh, uh, chart. Um, so that's uh, since 2003, uh, been always uh, HIV, malaria, and TB. And then since our second program started in 2014, we expanded to also include neglected infectious diseases. So uh, the WHO's list of NTDs, uh, minus those that are not um, prevalent in Africa, uh, low respiratory tract infections, diarrheal diseases, and emerging and re-emerging uh, infectious diseases, uh, including Ebola, yellow fever, Lassa fever, and of course, more recently, COVID-19. We support uh, all phases of clinical trials from phase one to four, including product-focused implementation research. And our approach really tries to integrate support for uh, research um, with the development of clinical research capacity uh, to strengthen the enabling environment uh, for conducting clinical research in sub-Saharan Africa. So while Clinical research is at the core of what we fund. We do have a comprehensive package of capacity development activities that we support alongside this. You can see these in this chart. This gives a snapshot of where we are in terms of funding. Um, so since 2014, <clears throat> we have to date uh, funded 430 grants to the tune of 814 million. About 84% of that goes towards uh, supporting collaborative clinical trials and clinical studies conducted by a European African consortium. Um, and that's 140 grants there that we support. And uh, the rest goes towards um, a combination of clinical research capacity development. Uh, so here, the enabling environment activities, so conducting for conducting clinical research, I think uh, this basically covers uh, ethics and regulatory capacities, for example, pharmacovigilance, health systems and services optimization, um, and so on. And then we have a comprehensive fellowship scheme that we support uh, currently 200, fe 200 fellows to try and focus on the career development of African scientists. Just move to the next slide. This shows um, our footprint across Europe uh, and Africa. So currently we're supporting uh, activities in 19 European uh, and 41 Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, 37 of those African countries are hosting recruitment sites for our clinical uh, studies. Uh, and although, um, so our funds are, uh, we can only refund um, participants or in research uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. The European Union or uh, countries associated to Horizon 2020. Um, but we do have a, a number of uh, researchers from elsewhere in the globe that do participate in these projects with funding from other sources. Um, so in rather strategic projects where um, co-funding is brought in from other sources. And um, I'll cite a couple of examples for that in, in, in shortly. Um, but it does mean that partners from elsewhere in the globe can participate in uh, grants that we support. Um, so uh, this shows the for the clinical research portfolio that we have uh, the breakdown by disease where you see TB uh, currently has the highest per proportion of funding, followed by malaria and HIV. And then uh, specifically looking at NIDs. Um, we are supporting um, 19 grants uh, in clinical uh, studies uh, specifically uh, to the tune of uh, 78 uh, million euros. And these are looking at new treatments or better or new diagnostics. Um, we also support one grant on vaccine development uh, and uh, several implementation research projects in this area. Uh, and in the NIDs area, we're also supporting about 20 fellows um, who are working on NID research. 
Uh, honing in on the NID's portfolio specifically, um, I just wanted to flag here uh, two projects uh, on schistosomiasis that we're supporting um, uh, together with, in partnership with the GHIT Fund. Uh, and this uh, has been mentioned already by uh, other colleagues, so I won't go into the details, but um, these uh, are uh, very important investments for us, the Prize of Quantal for um, preschool age children uh, projects where we've invested uh, 2 million together with GHIT and other co-funders and uh, the ADOPT grant uh, that uh, has just been mentioned by Daisuke. Um, and this uh, is also uh, an important investment of 5.7 million for us together with other co-funders. And we're really looking forward to seeing um, yeah, the outcome of these, uh, these projects and um, to try and have an impact on um, addressing this uh, neglected population. Just to quickly speak about other areas that we're uh, supporting um, in Africa, we have four regional networks of excellence that we uh, established in 2009 across uh, Central, Eastern, Western and Southern Africa. And these are networks of research centers that are involved in clinical trials uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa to facilitate research collaboration, uniting diverse institutions uh, between uh, the four regions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and trying to ensure capacity development and sharing of skills and knowledge. We also, uh, in 2016, uh, have supported two large uh, international epidemic preparedness consortia called ALERT and Pandora ID Net. Uh, and these are basically multidisciplinary consortia that are aiming to try to provide accelerated uh, clinical management of patients uh, for guiding public health response to severe infectious uh, outbreaks. And as you can imagine, they have been very actively involved now in um, responding to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So um, speaking of COVID-19, what uh, have, has our experience been of this? Well, um, I won't go through every item on this slide. It's quite busy, but basically uh, we receive uh, feedback from our grantees that they are, of course, experiencing uh, a major impact from the COVID pandemic. Um, delays and disruptions in research, um, extended timelines for ethics and regulatory approvals for a variety of reasons, restrictions affecting the transport of uh, equipment, reagents, investigational products, and this of course then leads to expiry, shortage of medicines, and trial investigational products. Um, closures of institutions, bans on meetings, uh, knock-on effects of delays to other projects, um, where the results are anticipated in order to be able to commence other uh, new projects. Um, intense pressure on workloads for clinicians and researchers in Africa and Europe, who you know, many of our grantees uh, are being pulled into um, COVID-19 activities exclusively and advising their governments on how to respond uh, to the outbreaks. Um, and um, yes, so generally a lot of uh, uh, issues and delays that have been reported from our grantees. So how are we dealing with that? Well, our response has been uh, three pronged, I would say. Um, firstly, to protect our current investments. Um, so where there have been projects that are severely affected by the situation, uh, we have been working with them to try and uh, address uh, and allow amendments where needed to incorporate COVID-19 research studies, a sample collection, uh, to um, have no cost extensions where needed. Um, we have, of course, our existing investment in the Epidemic Preparedness Consortia, and um, this has proven to be um, a very uh, good investment that has been uh, deployed uh, through the pandemic, uh, and they have been actively involved uh, in activities, as I mentioned. And then um, we've uh, secondly launched uh, new calls and investments in 2020, we had an emergency response uh, funding call uh, to support research activities in sub-Saharan Africa to manage um, uh, or, or prevent the spread of COVID-19. And uh, we have ultimately supported 28 projects um, with 13.6 million. Um, and these are hosted in 25 sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and, you know, we've also looked uh, together with other partners at how to deal with um, the situation. And uh, with Africa CDC, for example, we launched a call last year 
um, to um, establish an African cohort of epidemiologists and biostatisticians um, to try to also uh, uh, respond to this um, situation and future uh, such pandemics. Um, and uh, then we've also, I think our third sort of main area is to look at how we can collaborate with other partners uh, in this space. Um, and um, we have, of course, as a member, observer member of GLOPID R, we've been participating actively in the COVID circle working group. Uh, we also have participated in other WHO initiatives, uh, including the R&D blueprint for global coordination mechanism, uh, the WHO global malaria programs, work streams looking at addressing the double challenge of malaria and COVID-19. Um, we participate in WHO AFRO's expert committee and the COVID-19 clinical research coalition. Um, uh, we are also supporting, for example, the Antikov consortium uh, led by DNDI uh, and, and some of the preparatory work for that clinical trial. Um, and the, work, and the, the data from our COVID-19 projects is being reported into the COVID-19 data portal. And then finally, just to mention Africa CDC, uh, one of our you know, key partners and how we are uh, working with them in the CONGRECT, uh, the Consortium for COVID-19 Vaccine Trials, um, and of course the, the call I previously mentioned. Um, one final slide to just look at the, the future perspectives. Um, you know, how can we harness the momentum of uh, what we've seen uh, through COVID-19 and the, the interest in supporting uh, poverty-related diseases? Um, how is EDCTP going to be looking at this going forward? Well, as with GHIT, we're also looking at a, a third program currently. Um, in early next year, we're expecting a global health EDCTP3 program our third program to be established as an Article 187 initiative under Horizon Europe, which is the next framework program for the European Union, with a budget of 1.6 billion. And um, without going into too much detail here, I just to summarize, basically, we we expect that the, the, the sort of the scope will be largely the same as the current program. So we will continue to focus on the unmet needs of vulnerable populations. Um, uh, and infectious diseases in Africa with some more global uh, perspectives and hoping to engage more global partners in this. Uh, we will also maintain our scope on the, uh, the clinical development of medical interventions, but with a greater emphasis on later stage product development. So phase three and four um, um, clinical trials and product focused implementation studies, um, a drive towards more patient centered approaches, um, more interdisciplinary research and um, trying to harness new technologies and will be cognizant to the need for, an, for developing and enabling regulatory environments, changes to clinical trials regulation and trying to learn from the lessons from COVID-19 impact on R&D in general. And we will also continue to try to support um, the vital gap on the interaction between uh, infectious and non-infectious diseases. And finally, just talking really to summarize around COVID-19, we want to continue to consolidate our role and our, uh, our initial investments already in uh, prevention and management of disease outbreaks, uh, epidemic preparedness, and the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance. So that's a little bit um, where we're looking forward uh, to the future and yeah, happy to discuss any questions. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, Lara, you mentioned some of the challenges uh, to conducting research over the past 18 months, including disruptions due to lockdowns in workplaces and schools. And I thought that was a really important point to make because it's so relatable. You know, we've all struggled with the necessary restrictions, but it's sometimes easy to forget that it's people, not just the institutions who are conducting the research and that those people might be working parents or carers who are no doubt frustrated by the difficulty of progressing research at the moment. And I think it's just another reason that we need um, vaccine access and supply to be available to everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are running a little short on time. I'm going to jump into some questions for the panel if they are ready. Um, and I might stick with Lara for the moment. Um, some of the other challenges that you mentioned in that slide related to supply chains and costs. And I was wondering if you're forecasting or expecting any improvement in those areas in the near future. And Daitsuki-san, maybe you can 
chip in as well, because you mentioned that some of your research, research and grantees had experienced extra costs associated with COVID. Is that about the same sort of area? Lara, perhaps you could begin. Do you want me to start? Sure, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yes, so um, indeed, this has been uh, an issue reported, you know, back when COVID started. And um, I think to some extent it does continue. But I think the main issue, particularly in terms of supply um, of, you know, medical interventions and investigational products was largely related to um, lack of air transport um, mm -hmm. issues, you know, around uh, this during the sort of lockdowns and so on. I think this is perhaps less of an issue now. Um, same for shortages in medicines. I think this has largely been resolved. Um, uh, and we are seeing that our projects are, you know, st sort of um, starting to start up again. They're managing to recruit and um, and to complete projects, uh, activities. So I think, um, you know, we're seeing an improvement, uh, but of course, you know, there are significant delays to our projects and 90% probably, maybe more, are, are still fans facing substantial delays and probably will require no cost extensions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Daisuki, is that the sort of thing that your grantees have experienced as well? Yeah, what we went through is quite similar. Um, <clears throat> that was mentioned by Lala. Um, so for, in our case, almost 70% of our projects uh, had to go through a significant delay due to COVID-19. Um, adding to the points mentioned by Lala, probably the uh, av availability of medical professionals uh, was also impacted uh, by the COVID-19, which led to the um, further delay of clinical trials. Yeah. So that was another aspect that, that we've seen. There are certainly some challenges um, that everybody has been facing. As you move into this third phase of, um, or the third replenishment of GHIT, I was wondering if you could speak about some of the challenges, you know, continuing challenges in raising funding um, from the Japanese government, mm -hmm. government particularly as ODA budgets are under pressure, mm -hmm. and also from pharmaceutical companies who really don't stand to make a financial return. So why are they investing in GHIT? And, and perhaps you could speak about the sort of messages that um, you find are effective in convincing some of these funders um, to commit to GHIT. Okay, so if we, if I can start talking about the challenges of raising funds from the Japanese government, so discussing with the representatives of Ministry of Health and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I have a sense that it would be extremely difficult to raise funding from the Japanese government if we simply repeat the same argument that we used for the previous replenishment. You know, as things stand now, every budget request which will be made by Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, it has to have a link to the fight against COVID-19. Right. Okay. Otherwise, Ministry of Finance colleagues would say, why now? Yeah. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we are at a critical time in terms of our replenishment effort. Um, but we really need to convince the government um, of the importance of continuing efforts or R and especially R&D efforts in neglected diseases. To do so, uh, another problem we are facing is that there is not many members of parliament who are supportive of continuing uh, research and development in neglected diseases. When it comes to COVID-19, probably, um, uh, as mentioned by Lala, uh, it's a, a very um, powerful, um, we have a very, very good environment where um, we, it, there's a high possibility of harnessing the momentum provided by COVID-19. But as GHIT is clearly focusing on neglected diseases only for the moment, um, it is very difficult to um, gain political support within the government. 
And when it comes to pharmaceutical companies, um, I must say, luckily, uh, most, our, most of our pharmaceutical partners are still committed to continue supporting JHIT because they saw, they are seeing an increasingly in, uh, increasing importance of global partnership that can be achieved through the inception of JHIT. So they have expanded the, uh, the partnership outside Japan in the field of neglected diseases R&D. And I strongly hope that they will uh, continue supporting based on those arguments. Well, Dr. Suki san I certainly hope that you are successful in your efforts um, to, to raise money because the GHIT does do such important work. Now, we are running out of time. I might just do a quick fire round of questions for the panel. Um, riffing on one of my favourite podcasts that was on The Good Place. I'd like you to each focus and just tell me what, it, what is one uh, thing that currently brings you hope in the field of neglected disease, R&D? Mahogo, could I start with you? Yes, of course. Um, I'm very actually optimistic. I think for the Japanese public, Unfortunately, COVID-19 was a very sad situation that the world had to face, but I believe that it really gave the on the ground experience of how it is to not have vaccines, not have access to health, doctor, basic um, medicine. And feeling that impact, I think people can now relay the importance of global health. And I used to work at the World Economic Forum where I used to work with business leaders. And for the first time in 2020, a lot of business leaders who I used to work at Doubles are now very keen to work on global health. So we actually submitted a policy proposal to Prime Minister, our former Prime Minister, Prime Minister Suga, to double Japan's global health ODA and really position global health as a priority within ODA policy. I think there's a lot of attraction about understanding the scale of importance of infectious disease global health, pandemic preparedness. And I think um, it's it's a lived experience for everybody. And I hope that um, there is a lot of challenges, but depending on how we can really present the story and narrative, I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. Nota San, what is something uh, that currently brings you hope in the field? Could we just take you off mute, Sorry. please? Thank you. In both the uh, COVID-19 pandemics and the NTDs, it becomes clear that it is important not only to protect individuals from infectious diseases and treat patients, but also to take action as soon as possible to minimize uh, social and economic losses. As for NTDs, we will consider strategies for social implementation of research outcomes from the early stage of R&D and respond to them. But also, we are uh, uh, preparing to launch the uh, SCAD program, uh, which is a strategic center of biomedical advanced research and development for preparedness and response. Uh, this, uh, this autumn, so our government decided uh, uh, a vaccine, uh, development, uh, vaccine strategy in Japan. So the SCAD will uh, develop a vaccine development uh, strategy uh, using uh, uh, the activity in the research uh, in Japan, not only in Japan, maybe, but also in, in the world to prepare the uh, next uh, pandemic. So, 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 so R&D is very much uh, uh, important uh, and uh, we, we will try to invest as much as possible, but uh, also we need to uh, uh, deliver such research outcomes to the uh, people uh, who are uh, 
uh, suffered from uh, infectious diseases. Absolutely. Thank you, Nodasan. Lara, are you able to give a quick response? What gives you hope? <laughs> sure. Yes, I mean, I think, um, I think, you know, COVID-19 has taught us that strategic partnerships and collaborations um, from diverse global health um, actors really strengthened the research response um, to the pandemic. And I think for me, that's really a sign of hope. And um, I, you know, of course, there are many negative things about the COVID-19 pandemic, but I do think it's really brought together a very diverse um, set of actors that have really come together uh, and worked to, to, you know, harnessing that power to try and, and, and achieve incredible results. I don't think it's necessarily um, reflective of, uh, of R&D in general for some of the ongoing diseases. I think COVID has maybe been um, a very uh, good example of how things can happen when you have really the political will and the financing to back it and a relatively stable uh, disease to, to, to deal with and to develop a vaccine for. Um, but I do think it gives hope and it gives um, an example of how, you know, we can all come together uh, to, to achieve incredible things in a very short time. Well so that would be my, my thoughts. Thank you. Tetsuki-san, anything to add? Sure. So what brings me hope is the speed of vaccination we have seen in Japan. People were saying that there is a strong tendency of um, vaccine hesitancy in Japan, but as of now, 73% of the population has already been fully vaccinated, which is amazing. Um, so um, there is an, a deeper understanding of um, preparedness for the infectious diseases um, that is widely shared among the population. And I really would like to um, leverage this momentum provided within Japan for the That's global. wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to our panel members, Lara Pandia, Masahiko Noda, Mohoko Kashiwakura, and Daizuki Imoto. To GHID for hosting the se session and to the Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine. Also to the members of the audience. Please take care and I wish you all the very best with your research endeavors. Thank you. <laughs>